Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Horasis Global Meeting 2022. This is the panel for civil society and the search for equitable economic growth. My name is Diana Sabrin, CEO and co-founder of OneAgrix. And today I'm pleased to have a panel of action takers. I hope each of them will spotlight the advocacy, initiatives and case studies of how their organizations are contributing towards ec equitable economic growth. So now we'll start with a short introduction of these two beautiful ladies here with me, and then I will introduce the topic. Now, each panelist will have two to three minutes to, uh, of window to discuss their points, and thereafter we have a round table for everyone. Now, let me introduce you to two ladies. We have here Vanessa Araya, Chief Strategy Officer of Buffalo Grid Portugal, and we have here Virginia Kuludong, Executive Director, Your Public Value Germany. And in no particular order, let's have, uh, you know, any of you ladies, you can start first. And uh, perhaps, uh, you, uh, Virginia, do you want to go? Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm coming regularly to Arasis, and it's usually a fantastic group of like-minded people. So I look forward to the discussion. My name is Virginia. Um, I have created uh, with 19 other like-minded um, NGO based in Berlin four years ago, which is called Your Public Value, and we'll discuss what public value is, but it's really bridging um, all the very important elements and, uh, of society, the environment, and well-being. Um, I have a long career as a strategic communicator, and I'm also a leadership coach uh, in my private life. Thank you. Thank you. And now let's have um, Vanessa. Let's introduce yourself and the work you do. Thank you, Diana. So my name is Vanessa Arell. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Buffalo Grid, a company in which I've been familiar with or involved with since 2014. Um, I joined the team two years ago now as the chief strategy officer to develop the partnerships and the deployment strategy. Since then, well, COVID did play a role in delaying our efforts. But what we do is we bring digital prosperity to the unconnected and the underserved. The way that our technology works is that it provides free streaming, downloading and solar powered charging for mobile devices where we can serve hundreds of people at a time in places where the digital divide is growing. So for the bottom of the economic pyramid, underserved, unconnected, or in the humanitarian space as well in refugee camps with a focus at the moment in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the technology is proprietary. Our founder and, uh, founder and CEO, Daniel Becerra, is an industrial designer who has been focused on bridging the digital divide and connecting, starting with farmers in Uganda, back in 2012 to charge their phones to today bringing a technology that is unique and will be making a difference. It started making a difference to thousands of people and we're looking at millions in the near future. Thank you, Vanessa. I'm really, really impressed and thank you for sharing that. Let's hear more later from the both of you on the work that you do. Now, to begin our discussion, in 2015, the international community pledged to jointly contribute to better ecological and social development by 2030. However, the SDG report shows that there has been more talk than action over the last seven years. The global commu community talks a lot about sustainability goals and achieving equitable economic growth, but has it invested enough in actionable solutions since then? With the multiplex of crisis we are experiencing at the moment from the COVID-19 pandemic to the strife between countries to natural disaster to the food crisis, can the SDG get back on track? Can equitable economic growth be achieved at the rate of progression it is now? Hi, ladies. I think something happened. She's back. <laughs> I actually, you froze. I, yes, anyway. I'm sorry. We're back. It's all good. It works. We can continue. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, no worries. So, 
<laughs> shall, shall I um, repeat what I've said? Is it just a short blurb about what we're no, going it's, to No, it's okay. It's okay. It's all we good? Can, we can continue. Yeah, we got it. Okay, perfect. So now um, I would like um, Virginia to start giving your two to three minutes um, uh, opinion and, um, and, and thought leadership on the topic. Thank you, Diana. You, you mentioned that it's time for action. There's been a lot of talk. And I think we all agree, but in a way, agreeing is also talking. And uh, that, that is quite Sorry. an issue, isn't it? So um, what we've learned, uh, absolutely, what is undisputable, is that altruism is essential. We absolutely uh, have crossed a point where it's essential for our own survival, for the survival of the planet, to make sure that the collective interests are taken care of. In a way, all the sustainability experts have been working on that for years, feeling totally isolated and sometimes uh, disappointed. Yeah, uh, But neuroscience tells us that actually people who who function with a collective interest are in huge ma minority on this world. All of us, the huge majority of us, are driven by personal interest. And therefore, we've had the discrepancy in the global discourse be between the need to take care of the planet and people and the implementation and the impact that they're seeing, because a lot of people are actually talking and not acting, as you mentioned, and God, greenwashing is going really uh, up and up. So what can we do? Um, I think it's quite important to have a disinterested concern about the well-being of others, but only because that brings back to us personally well-being as well. And so I think what is important today is to demonstrate that the collective well-being, including of the planet and people, means our personal well-being. It's only when we demonstrate this bridge, only when we are able to demonstrate the bridge between profit and the common good, that we can hope having some, uh, some traction some traction about sustainability and things. Otherwise, there are some social enterprises that are doing fantastic good. I have created an NGO. I won't say that we're not going, doing fantastic things, but we don't see this, the traction. So at Your Public Value, we have co-created, we function only with co-creation. So we have co-created and co-developed principles that could be implemented in the corporate world. We call them the nine public value principles. Were 124 European experts in business ethics, in sustainability, in diversity, um, who really participated in a very vibrant and very vivid conversation and debate to come to these uh, principles and then to actually co-create an assessment tool. So we have the tools, and we're not the only ones. <clears throat> to be very honest, a lot of organizations have their own tools, and we are like-minded. But the multiplication of tools is not going to help. The uh, co-creation, we thought, would, be, would bring traction, but it actually does bring a lot of traction in a silo, in a group of like-minded. So the main question is, how can we enlarge this group of like-minded, like the three of us today, how can we enlarge it to make sure that it's 30 people, 300, 3,000 people sharing these views and implement it? There is one international organization that is doing a fantastic job. This is the OECD, and they have developed um, actually a well-being framework they, I remember when the G20 was in Japan, was it two years ago, they <coughs> advocated for the well-being framework to be um, embraced by states instead of the only GDP as a, uh, as a measure. GDP actually leads to more economic growth, 
but only. And then we have people remaining on the side and we have discrepancies and we have the inequalities that we know with GDP. New Zealand is so far the only country that has fully embraced the uh, OECD well-being framework. It was discussed in many uh, other countries, including in Europe, in Finland, in Scotland, but there is no traction. So when you're saying what can civil society do to, for equ equitable economic growth, I think we may need to focus our attention and our advocacy and as civil society requests that the measurement tools be totally changed, doesn't mean that we should put GDP as a measurement tool in the trash, but we should at least consider some other measurement at the same level, just like New Zealand has done. And that includes education, that includes health, that includes environmental capital, social capital, human capital, Uh, and economic capital, of course, we cannot forget that. But with these four capitals, actually, uh, we can get to a change of a vision of economic growth. Um, just a reminder that public value is a very old concept. Uh, it has existed. We didn't create uh, it. And it means considering society and the natural environment as active stakeholders of any uh, corporation. So this uh, framework of well-being is exactly what we uh, would like to advocate for as well. Thank, thank you, Virginia. You. Thank, thank you so much. Now, uh, we will discuss uh, the framework of well-being much later because uh, it's relevant to the, the conversation and Vanessa here would be able to share more about what she does, with, um, you know, which is you know, part of that um, well-being framework. So now, Vanessa, um, now the, the mic is to you now and um, let's hear about your views on the topic today. <sighs> All right. So it's a, it's a tough one because I agree with uh, a lot of what, um, what has just been say, said by Virginie, but I also severely disagree. So I think the main problem here is that we need to begin translating between the PhDs, the government, the NGOs, the multilaterals, it is civil society, social enterprises and corporates. Nobody is speaking the same language. Leading on all of these ideas like the SDGs and, you know, all of these amazing minds that got together, it got together in a little bit of a la-la land to put together this dream that in by 2030, we were going to achieve these extraordinary goals. They're great benchmarks to have, but let's be realistic. The, you know, seven, 17 of them sound wonderful on paper and they look wonderful on the logos of companies that we work on this and we work on that. But go out to the streets to the people that it's actually supposed to benefit and they do not understand what the logos mean and they do not see the benefit. And this I'm saying because I've spent a lot of time in developing countries with the work that we do. You can't go in there saying we're supporting the SDGs because it's actually kind of offensive. So I think the first thing we all need to discuss here is that we're not speaking the same language. So the ones that came up with the idea had an academic perspective with maybe some on the ground work, but it's very top bottom approach. There's not much grassroots approach going on there. It is our job, people like us on this call, you know, people that are like minded to start translating and to start changing the narrative. So we include the ones that we're supposed to be benefited. So I actually believe that the whole purpose of civil society is to come together so we all understand what the hell we're talking about. It's like the tower, it's like Babylon going on here. When I read about the SDGs and when I hear people talk about them or when, you know, from, from the government perspective of a lot of the development work and multilaterals and NGOs, it's almost Chinese to me. And I work in this space, you know. It, it's 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 just I don't I, I struggle to follow a lot of the jargon and a lot of the very when you could say it very simply. So then it becomes a global dialogue or a global narrative where everybody feels welcome to participate. And I think that's what should be civil society. Simple, common language where we can all come together and feel safe and honest in order to express our views. I mean, it really does come down to that. And then you also have the, the hierarchical and the structures that have existed for so long that are very slow moving. So you can have all the greatest intentions 
at the top of, a, of an organization or of a corporate or of a multilateral or a government who wants to change things and do things differently. But they're all working upon very established bureaucratic systems that have existed forever. So regardless of the fact that if you start digitalizing something now, when you, when you come from over here and you still have to tick the boxes on all the papers that started in the 50s, 60s, 70s or 80s. So you've got a load of paperwork to do here plus your digital checklist over here. So you're exhausted doing that before you can actually do anything to implement it. So the system is also rigged for things to not really support what we're all talking about here. So we can talk the whole, you know, 30 minutes we have left about what we're doing and what we want to do and everything when ultimately the system is not supporting us, nor the people receiving the work that we're doing. So, yes, there are outliers, you know, these key people that are phenomenal, who are not afraid to do things differently, who are not afraid to take risks, who are not afraid to take chances. And that's what I do. I go out and I look for those people. I'm, I'm finding those people and we're creating a, a, a community of action doers, you know, not just talking, but action and, and actually making things happen. It's a, the African proverb is perfect. Do you want to go fast? Go alone. You want to go far, go together. But, but, you know, we all have to be walking the same language path. We all have to be on the same narrative. Otherwise, you know, we're walking parallel roads together. And it's still not serving as many people as it potentially could be. So that's my perspective on, on, on this particular topic. I think it's a system and a language problem that we all need to address in order to do a better job individually and collectively. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Now, this, is, this will get really interesting. So now from Virginia, what, what we've learned here about, you know, you talk about altruism, you talk about the importance of altruism, but at the same time, interestingly, you also mentioned about how you have seen in social science where minorities will do things together and they will come together and do things, whereas the majority would basically go on their own solo offshoots, right? And this is where I think where then it crosses over to what Vanessa is talking then when we have that, what we also have is a disconnect um, with the communi between communities, between stakeholders. So we, we talk a lot, I noticed this even with my work in technology, I mean, and agriculture, we talk a lot about multi-stakeholder approach. We talk a lot, wow. a lot about, okay, um, how do governments uh, work together with civil society, work together with communities, work together, together in the grassroots, like what Vanessa mentioned about grassroots, but then how are they communicating the language is so complex. There's no like consistency. Like. Exactly. Exactly. For example, um, you know, I think Virginia, you, you give a very good example here. You, you said that the OECD um, has actually, you know, done a great job on the well-being um, framework. But only, look at this, even between governments, I'm sure there's a communication issue here. Only New Zealand has fully embraced it. Now, my, my um, suspicion it is because people do not understand the nuance. People who are working in this, um, in this cabinet, they do not understand. You can't have, um, and, and I always get this from, you know, when, with my board meetings, you can't have a minister of trade, for example, discussing ministries of health issues in a COVID-19 pandemic. So you see, it is a disconnect and even in, in, in that level. So now let's talk about, you know, solutions. How can we actually bridge this communication issue first. Let's discuss that. What is that, that disconnect that we have identified? How can we do it? And I want the Virginia to give um, her views first, and, and then we go again uh, to, to Vanessa, because then you, you must be wondering, is this important in search for equitable economic growth? Yes, it is, because if we do not solve the communication issue, you know, in a relationship, it's a breakdown. Yep. You're right, absolutely right. Um, the entire global economy is structured around silos. Uh, governments are structured in silos. Every company, uh, I mean, as a leadership coach, I, can, I coach all day long people who are suffering from silos, and yet it is constantly replicated. Just because the complexity of the situation, if you take care of other silos or other specialty actually gives the impression that you are slowing down on your own progress. So one of the main um, blockages, I think, is um, 
is uh, discussing, and I'm thinking aloud, my apologies, because it's a new uh, topic that just came, in, came up, but I think one of the blockages is indeed the, um, the adjective uh, that is always and systematically attached to growth and which is speed, you know, fast growth, um, you know, with even the startups and the new, um, we have fast growth pains, we have, uh, it has, growth means speed. And speed means silo. So if we want to bridge uh, actually, these silos, if we want to take your example, Diana, to have the Ministry of Trade, keeping in mind the interest of the Ministry of Health to get to a better distribution of, um, of medicine in times of pandemics, that makes total sense. The ultimate objective is well-being of the population, but they don't. They don't, and the silos is actually uh, a way to keep a, a, a closed environment that is um, conducive to corruption, to organized corruption, that is that rejects a third party um, uh, investigation or audit. And all we, we actually need to start thinking in terms of a flat, horizontal mentality. So I agree with Vanessa, the words can be important and the translation is important. I'm a linguist myself. I wouldn't say that translation is not important, but it's translation of concepts. It's accepting your concept. It's accepting your references, knowing that we are a like-minded beyond the, the language. Give you the floor in a moment, uh, <laughs> Vanessa. <laughs> uh, it's... Uh, it's you don't need to be a specialist of health when you're in the Ministry of Trade, but you need to have enough dialogue so you understand what is important, what are the red lines and which red lines you shouldn't cross. So once we accept the red lines, the flags, and we have a more horizontal approach, you can say wishful thinking, but we can actually build on bridging profit, making more profit uh, and uh, and public value, the common good, society, the environment. It's slower, but it goes further. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Now, uh, Vanessa. I just think that it's, um, I think that there is a global kind of attitude as a cop out for actually really doing things differently. And COVID was the perfect example and opportunity to just jump in and be like, all right, nothing worked. We have this global pandemic. We need to do things differently. And it, it could have been used on that level as such a shakeup. I think civil society should be based on what the majority needs, requires and understands. So we cannot be here talking about civil society when we're being represented by an extreme minority who do not speak the language or understand really what's going on, you know, to, in the masses, in the greatest of, of, of the uh, of the of the demographics of the groups of people. Um, I'm still struggling with, I personally am struggling with this whole conversation. I think that there is a lot of um, excusing and laziness uh, around, you know, it's much easier to not really try and change something because it's already like that and I'm very comfortable and it works for me and my family because, um, we're, but at the same time as we're living the COVID crisis, what's going on in the world, the food shortages, everything, that divide is growing and, and it's not being noticed because it's happening in the global south, one might want to call it, or in the bottom of the economic pyramid or with the yeah. humanitarian crisis. I mean, just alone, I think it's in 15 years, the amount of refugees has increased over 70 million people in under 15 years, yeah. which is insane. Just with the Ukraine crisis, and, and this is one of the issues um, you know, one of the issues or one of the things that I've been plagued with and this thought working with StreamSpot Plus in, a, in the refugee scenario in sub-Saharan Africa, where you have settlements and refugee camps that are older than 20 years, people spend an average of 22 years in that space, in, that, uh, um, in the camps and in, the, in this. You know, Ukraine happens and all of a sudden we get requests to redirect our efforts from one day to another. 
from what we're doing in you know Bangladesh with underserved and and um, unconnected communities to bring digital prosperity and on our way to BDBD camp and to Rwanda camp Rhino camp in Uganda Kakuma in Kenya all of a sudden as a drop of a hat I'm expected to divert those efforts to Ukraine and and that was a very difficult call to say guys sorry I mean because they're white Christians, to put it mildly, and they're at the doorstep or within Europe. We have to stop the work that we're doing somewhere where it's extra. It, it's so needed. They've been so. Uh, I'm not even going to go into what we already know. It, it was an ethical call to say thank you very much, but at the moment our fo- you know, our focus continues where we are, and there's a lot of aid going there. And I completely understand that it's needed, but we cannot forget what has been growing systematically and historically as a reality around the globe because a certain crisis happens, which kind of goes back to what I was saying before about the language and the systems. We also seem to follow fads and fashions when we're talking about the sustainable development and the SDGs. It's like, oh, the recent crisis, oh, all our efforts are going to go there. And I, don't, I, I think I'm sounding like a complainer in this space right now because I seem to be very negative. But in all of that, There's a lot of truth because there's a lot of very like-minded people who are sticking the course, who are looking at the bigger picture rather than, you know, the the, the fashion now or what the crisis is now and creating um, dynamics, communities, tribes, groups, whatever you want to call them, who are working together to a greater rollout and a bigger change. And that to me is the civil society. And that is the responsibility of civil society to just look at it wider and make it inclusive. Prosperity on every level belongs to, we have a right to it, all of us. Yes, I def- definitely um, agree with you, Vanessa. And you're not a complainer. I think it, it comes to a point now, seven years, when the SDG report came out now and said that seven years and more talk than more action, it's time to actually be honest. So what I view personally, both of you are being honest and honesty is very important for progress. Now, the out- outcome of debate is not about winning, it's about progress. And I think w- we stand this spirit, I think that's good. Now, you talk about um, prosperity, inclusivity. Now, I want to talk about the digital divide. Now, this is where it gets interesting, because with the digital div- divide, this is where I think it can be the bridge and solution to equitable economic growth. Now, I want to hear now from um, both of you on how do you feel that, do you think that the digital, bridging the digital divide, giving access to internet, to network, to the rural areas of the world will bridge that? Will we, now I do not want to sound cliche on the SDGs now, but will we be able to bridge some of it um, in spirit? Um, so, so anyone you can, yes, any one of you can take this first. That's just because that's our area of expertise. So I completely I am a thousand percent a believer, Daniela, CEO and founder as well at StreamSpot Plus, that the digital divide is key to development. But there's different ways of bridging the digital divide. It's not just so let's be realistic. Connectivity in terms of access to the Internet is not going to happen tomorrow. The infrastructure, the fiber optic satellites are very expensive. And in order to bring so to bring all of these people into digital prosperity, which is bridging the digital divide, will be next to impossible as it's traditionally known. The work that we do is we bring access to digital content and services that are offline. So our units work with a SIM card. They connect to the cloud. We update the content. People come and stream and download for free whilst they charge their phones because the units are solar powered. So they're not dependent on mains power or Internet access or or fiber optics. We use an ethics council to choose the content and the content is very, so going back to grassroots, very grassroots. We work with the national curriculum in every country, providing education, supplementary education from children to adult learning and entrepreneurial practices, huge focus on women's development. Um, Then we have health and we work within what each country offers uh, in terms of health and other complementary things. So say if we're in a refugee camp, we go into the refugee camp and we work with focus groups and volunteers in the communities and the NGOs to identify what people need. So we're bringing an offline internet that provides all of that access because they cannot afford data. Data is very expensive in all the developing world. So first barrier is access because they can't afford it. They're all getting mobile phones because they're becoming cheaper and it's opening up market for mobile network operators, but they lack the digital skills. 
So what do we need to do? We need to give people access to digital skills so they can start navigating content that is useful, not necessarily social media and all of that. So I think that bridging the digital divide is not necessarily focused immediately in terms of access to the internet and the whole, because we've seen the damage the internet has had in the developed world towards children, uh, you know, the mental health and development, distraction, procrastination. But if we can keep the access to bridging the digital divide, building digital skills, digital literacy and development through that digitalization, then people can spend the little that they have on maybe earning a living, on trade, on doing, there's a lot of programs and, and work being developed that is remote for people in developing countries that they get paid in mobile money. But if they can get all of that teaching and all of the training on an offline system such as ours or whatever is available to them, then you're reducing the cost by about 80%. So I, I, I totally agree that the digital divide is essential to development and bridging it. There's just different ways of doing it. It doesn't have to be the we're going to have the whole world with fiber optics and, you know, everybody access to power by 2030. It's not going to happen. But there's shortcuts, there's hacks, there's systems, there's different things, not just ours, but there's many. And I think that's where some attention and effort is still needed to go to. Thank you, Vanessa. I think the, the key here is consistency. We, we want to see consistency and consistency builds up to its action. So now, Virginia, let's hear with, with your public value. Thank what you. Are your Thank you, and thank you, Vanessa, for uh, articulating uh, what you do on the ground. That's very interesting. I particularly uh, like the, the fact that you mentioned ethics and uh, the thorough uh, discussion you have before uh, choosing uh, content. In your public value, when we started to co-create principles um, of public value, we, we wanted to include the digital dimension. So it's basically principles that are articulated across four dimensions, ESGD, and uh, the, the dimension D is about ethical use of data and technology. There is so much to do here. I think we again all agree uh, that um, sometimes uh, algorithms have been, have been very detrimental in the developed world, not to mention the behavior uh, and, and the changes in, in behavior uh, among the young, but not only uh, people. So, Yes, I think uh, ethics and ethics of algorithm is something very important. Now, it's not a conversation that you see often in the big companies, uh, target audience are companies, right? Uh, so, yes, they discuss ESG just because there are standards. And we, we talked at the beginning, the difficulty of, you know, ticking the box and uh, some people are some companies are even recruiting or creating departments just to fulfill the, the, the standards uh, that are requested by uh, Brussels or by uh, other donors. Uh, but they tend to forget the D and the ethics of, what they, of <clears throat> how they use their own data, how people can have or should have access to their own data, uh, the ethics of their own algorithm. So there is a lot to do here. And it, uh, it's not, uh, it shouldn't be only behind the scenes and, and left to people who really understand uh, what uh, digital technologies are. I think it's a topic that uh, customers should embrace uh, because it's in their own interest as well. And so a lot of advocacy needs to be done here as well. Thank you very much, uh, Virginia. Now, wh while we both talk about the solutions that both of you have already done and the potential of it, now we talk about, uh, let's talk about PPP, public-private partnerships. And I think this is essential for us to bridge that gap as well, because you know what? Let's be honest. It's not just about human effort that both of you and your teams have brought to the refugees, to the you know um, communities that, are, that, that needs such technologies, such help, but then there's not enough grants given by governments. Do you think, um, how do you think we can accelerate this in a PPP framework? Because I know both of you have done some work um, in that space, and I think it's great for us to be honest and have a conversation about it, because then that is towards the search for equitable economic growth. So Vanessa, you can begin on this. 
I think it's it's fundamental. It is part of the key. And most importantly, because when you have that, you don't replicate efforts. So the, the greatest waste happens when there is no dialogue or conversation or collaboration between PPP, basically. Because yes. one's doing here, the other one's doing there, but we're all doing the same, but we're all ticking the box and we all think we look great. So yeah. that is... That is the, the, the most important, the best. I mean, someone should actually invent an app like the Uber driver side of an app where PPP people can go in and be like, oh, this is what I want to do here. And it's like, ah, they want to do it too. And everybody goes tick, tick, tick. And there's no more replication because I'm assuming it will reduce waste of grants, of budgets, of expenditure by at least 50%, if not more. And this is just kind of an idea that, 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 that is in my head. That would be probably the greatest thing anybody could do for the SDGs was, would be to create that app or that community network where everybody can plug in what they're doing and where. And it, it like a dating app for SDG efforts, in all honesty, would be amazing because then you would have complete synergy or, or people, you know, collaborating instead of stepping on toes, increasing the silos, because we also have to admit that is, as a company, I'm doing a project and somebody else, another one in the same place, we're competing. There's no point in competing when ultimately it's to benefit, you know, civil society or economic growth or whatever it is. So maybe we can put that out there and somebody will put that little dating app, you know, kind of dating app together for people in the PPP space. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that, that's a wonderful idea. Um, but no, to, to be honest, um, multi-stakeholder approach helps and it reduces waste, as you've mentioned. Um, in fact, governments and, and organizations would ha will actually save time. Efficiency will increase because then they do not have to sift out silos and solo proposals just to get things done, just to work towards exactly. fulfilling some of the SDG goals. It would be, oh, okay, this is a consortium. They work at this. We only view one or two or three. Let's say some people are still wanting to be working in, in that huge consortium side. I'll share with you later what I mean by that. But, but, but you see, that's, that's the, the key there. Reducing waste and, in, in, and increasing efficiency by working together. So now, Virginia. Uh, well, of course, we all agree. And of course, we, are, we keep discussing about the verticals of this word when the well-being framework that we have mentioned is a horizontal framework and, and civil society is just dreaming of breaking the silos and we're doing our best. Now, the multi-stakeholder dialogue, it works to a certain extent. But it is a lot slower. I mean, we've done it. We, we have co-created these principles. Took us a full year. And 124 uh, experts. And God, they were fighting for their own comma and their own work. And they mm -hmm. meant the same. So we had a one-year fight, but like vibrant fight, of between 124 people who were thinking alike. So imagine what what can be done when we don't when we reach out to people who don't care vanessa yeah no i was going to say one thing is people that think alike another thing is people that do alike yes this, we go back to the beginning you know yes, yes. doing is very different to talking so exactly. well, of course but we also started this conversation by saying communication is key and we all need to speak the same language. So we are at that level, we're an NGO and we're doing advocacy. So we are trying to actually enlarge the community of, of like-minded and, and make sure that people who use a particular uh, framework of thought agree with others because it doesn't really matter which framework you use or which concept you refer to as long as you can you understand that you think alike and you can do things together. Fully agree. But we started with the communication, the need to talk to each other. And so we are at that uh, level when you clearly do things uh, in, uh, you know, in, in, in a lot of countries. So, the yes. I have a question <laughs> for you, Virginie. One thing is, you know, what, how fast does it take someone to figure out that you can actually work with someone or not? From your experience as a professional executive coach and everything, I mean, really, honestly, how long does it take to figure that for out? For me, a few minutes. I the already know that I can with? work with you, although we've been in disagreement, kind of. <laughs> so we can work together. Uh, exactly. It depends on everyone. It really depends. 
actually uh, people care it's about we need to uh, we need to bring in the the caring moment uh, the people us who are like minded we really care about others and so we could be in strong disagreement but Overall, what we want to do is to work together to do and to make sure that the collective interest takes over. Uh, and so we, that... we, we've all forgot to mention this, that even in disagreement and conversation, there's learning. There so we learning. learn different ways of communication. We learn different ways of seeing things. We learn different ways of, of, of proposing things even or looking at things, thinking about things and executing things. And we even this whole conversation haven't mentioned when you said disagreement, I'm like, this woman's amazing. I want to learn from her. That's why I felt it was important to say because learning is the key to exactly. changing the systems. Learning and caring. And when you put the two together, you can actually do some good. Mm -hmm. We Perfect. agree. <laughs> yes. So, so basically, um, you, you know, uh, agree to, to disagree and the outcome has always be progress. Now we have left four minutes and I think we can um, talk about one last um, topic, subtopic for, for in search for equi um, equitable economic growth. And I want to talk about greenwashing. Now, of course, now there is obviously lack of action um, in, in terms of fulfilling the SDGs. But now we are talking about greenwashing. So how do you think this would affect the progress? Oh, my God. And you decided to bring the greenwashing topic four <laughs> minutes before the end. I love it. Uh, so, yes, it's a universe. It's a universe. Uh, uh, it's actually con a continuation of thinking in terms of growth, immediate and exclusively financial growth, surfing on the ocean of sustainability, Uh, languages and sustainability topics because, unfortunately, we have seen that one of the leverages of sustainability is reputation. So when companies really think in terms of reputation, in terms of immediate uh, growth and financial growth, there is a risk of greenwashing. Uh, and I cannot say that everyone greenwashes. I don't think it's true. But even when they start, you know, Uh, communities or things like that, there is uh, uh, very little that uh, that is done. Yeah. Thank you, Virginia. That's the reason why I ended with this, right? Because at every conversation, that every conversation, it starts off very optimistic, um, you know, very challenging in the middle. But then at the end, let's get back to reality and say that, okay, there's this, and then go out of this conversation, conversation going that, okay, there's work to be done. See us action takers. So now, Virginia, um, no, Vanessa, Can you give the your views on this? It can be used as a great excuse excuse to do the bare minimum, but it mm -hmm. you know yeah. it really can it is my perspective. There are people that do a tremendous amount with the efforts that they do uh, around you know sustainability and their commitments and everything. But when you look at it from the negative perspective, it's a scapegoat to do the bare minimum and to look okay and to tell your shareholders and your customers oh, this is what I'm doing, whilst actually denying the truth. Because it's, it's a screen, it's a, it's a smoke screen more than washing. It's a smoke screen because all the crap is still behind that screen. There's nothing washed away. So I think it's a great scapegoat in a, in a, in a screen and a way to hide the truth and the reality to make yourself look better. Okay. Now, now we have two more minutes, but then I want your final thoughts, your final views, and perhaps um, Virginia, what do you think would be the best solution after this conversation and for you, what action would you take in search for equitable economic growth? So I'm, I'm about advocacy, right? Um, and I'm always, uh, I, I, was, I was really impressed when this horrific, uh, awful uh, ecological disaster happened in Japan Uh, and after the tsunami and then the uh, radioactivity, the civil, civil society, you know, even people just like us, became scared of nuclear uh, plants and safety, which was at the bottom of nuclear mm -hmm. authorities as uh, a priority, became a top priority, just pushed by the request of 
people. So we have leverage. We actually, I believe in it. I'm an activist. I created an NGO and not a firm. I really believe that there is leverage. And so the problem is to make sure that we, uh, we all can work together and make sure that we really understand what we need uh, for the well-being of society and the economy. Thank you so much. And Vanessa? Keep going. You know, resilience, never give up, keep on knocking on doors, keep on having conversations like this, you know, agree to disagree, but there's a lesson learned, uh, another door opens, a connection happens and keep on following, keep on going because I mean, I have an objective, we all have a passion and objective in our values. I think as long as we agree that we want things to change and we are going to be action takers in terms of changing it, then we're already part of the same crew, um, you know, connecting friends. Uh, people, you should talk to so and so. Just don't stop. A no is an opportunity for a lot of other ways of looking at things and to continue go going. So that's my. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to these two wonderful ladies and um, thought leaders. And I'm very, very honored to be speaking to both of you. And um, I know this is a conversation which can go on with the numerous solutions that we can do and work to and how we can work together. And um, so we've come to the end of our panel. And I would like to say that, you know, three things, collaboration, consistency, and human connection. With these three, we are resilient. And we, as a human race, would be able to give a, a more equitable economic growth. So thank you very much, everyone, for watching, for tuning in. Thank you. And let's take this offline. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank Diana. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.